Hymir is a distant planet. It is a seed world home to a wide range of organisms descended from Earth flora and fauna that have been copied on Chimir, then set loose to evolve independently in this new context. This means of this replication is the Great Portal, one of many forms of magic that make up the indigenous life of the planet, which performs these harvests in an effort to optimize its habitat with high biodiversity of flora and fauna. Around two million years ago, the known world underwent a period of aridity due to shifting currents and a stronger tilt of the planet. The subsequent extinctions triggered a harvest from Southeast Asia. A wide range of animals iconic to modern Chimere trace their ancestry to this harvest. Incoming animals often bring diseases which result in further extinctions coupled with this new competition. This cycle is partially why harvests can last so long. This particular harvest saw a notable amount of diseases which seem to have hit a lot of animals already struggling from climate change, particularly pronghorns, barbarophilids, and rhinos. The dinosaurs seem to have been largely unaffected by this new competition and disease, but since they tend to prefer habitats with more ferns and conifers than grass and flowering plants, this should not be surprising. This instability continued and many of the animals brought through the portal, such as gar, small grazers, and proboscideans, kept going extinct. Perhaps in an effort to fill in the gaps, the portal extended its harvesting range, which brought it overseas to a new continent, Sahul. During much of the Pleistocene, the land we now know as Papua, Australia, Aru Islands, and Tasmania were joined together in a single continent, called Sahul, Papua land, or Meganesia, depending on your school of thought. I'll be using Sahul since it seems to be convention. At the time, Sahul was much more verdant than the region is today. Rainforests and brush habitats were in far greater abundance. Open mosaic forests were scattered throughout. This proved quite analogous to the known world at the time, and a lot of Australian flora and fauna established themselves. Not all survived to modern times, of course, but there was a period of stability where many regions had a high population of Australian megafauna. The saltwater crocodile is the largest crocodile on Earth today. Although far from the case in Chimere, they are the most successful crocodile species and most widespread crocodilian after the common caiman, which has held this title since the arrival in the Miocene. A higher tolerance for saltwater than most crocodiles, while still being comfortable in fresh water and on land, seems to have helped them thrive in the inland sea and coastal regions. The monitor lizard Moduru is arguably the apex predator of the inland sea islands, and outcompeted the saltwater caiman that once occupied the niche, but the saltwater crocodile is far more abundant in modern Chimere. Both are prey to the occasional giant crocodilian, or Kurujaku, but for the most part, these two share the title of Island King. Many snakes were brought during this harvest. Although the Chimere and Cobras, a clade of hooded elapids which are not in the cobra genus we recognize on Earth today, make up a majority of venomous snakes. However, vipers and other elapids like true cobras and typhons have established themselves. The Housie Taipan is one of the many venomous snakes on the prairie, possessing among the most potent venom of Chimerian snakes, and certainly the strongest of recent harvests, and shares a common ancestor with other typhons found in Papua and Australia. The Rainbow Serpent of the Arvelith Lowland Rainforests is the last of the Madsoyid snakes of the known world. These snakes are among the most successful in Chimere as a whole, but they have not recolonized the known world in the aftermath of the dynastic extinction in any large quantities. Madsoyids are notable for being very basal clade of snakes, being non-venomous constrictors, but lacking the jaw flexibility to swallow large prey. Many wetlands of the eastern continent see these snakes as apex predators, constricting large semi-aquatic mammals and feeding on organs and other tender portions, using serrated teeth and long jaws to rapidly portion out their prey. The rainbow serpent lacks this level of specialization, usually hunting small game, but will occasionally tackle larger prey with softer bellies that they can pull apart. Their name comes from a striking iridescence, especially when wet, shining as a bright rainbow while sunning on a high branch. Terrestrial birds have a long and successful history in Chimere. 
During the Tyrant Dynasty, Enanti Ornithians had several clades of large granivores that evolved along similar lines as ratites. This niche in the Titan forests was occupied, and cassowaries were unable to establish themselves. The Dromornithid Geniornis had success in Arvel, feeding on tough fruits and seeds, adapted to be processed by large parrots which are now extinct. Competition with Theskelosaurs have kept them fairly restricted, and they aren't found in foothills or wet lowlands, but they tend to do quite well in the interior Titan gardens, where their long legs give them an advantage in getting around compared to the similarly sized drakes, which typically have stockier legs. Emus were the breakout stars of the birds. At the time, the highlands of the south of Arvel were becoming desolate as currents that once brought warm waters were diverted south. Able to go for weeks without eating, a week without drinking, and able to eat a wide range of food, emus came to this desolation primed for enduring harsh conditions. Very quickly they spread throughout this habitat. To this day, Emus are still one of the most common herbivores on the highland steppes, west to the deserts, and they can outpace most local predators. Many flying birds of Australia are found in the known world. Kookaburras are large kingfishers that specialize in small game and hunt in dense forests. The crested kookaburra is the most common of this genera, and is found in most of the wet lowland forests of the known world their cackle a common aspect of jungle ambiance. Magpies of Chimere can primarily trace their lineage to this harvest, although some European magpies from the next harvest were integrated into the population as hybrids. These birds are aggressive, intelligent, and highly territorial, dominating their territories with charges. They are restricted to the north as the jay crow, a large species of jay that has been in Chimere since the Miocene, maintains a hold of the niche and shares their aggressive tendencies. Many hornbills can be found in the rainforests of the known world. The double-beaked hornbill shares, shares a genus with the helmeted hornbill of Earth, but is a unique species. They are uncommon, but widespread throughout the denser rainforests of the known world. Although there is a wide range of non-Therian mammals in the known world, and many clades lay eggs, this harvest brought the first monotreme since the dynastic extinction. The Chimeran platypus is found throughout the lowland steppes of Arvel. While many species of the harvest have derived, in some cases considerably, the platypus is the same species and has no distinguishing characteristics from their modern Earth cousins. The swamps of Arvel seem to have been an easy habitat for them to transition into, slotting into a niche held by a now-extinct semi-aquatic multituberculate. Unfortunately, competition with the common otter in the past 100,000 years or so has put a lot of pressure on them, and they have lost much of their initial range. While not of this harvest, fossils of the collection of the Great Library of Balundakoi show that a clade of giant platypuses was quite successful in Arvel during the Tyrant Dynasty. Long assumed extinct, a specimen recently acquired by the Great Library by agents of the Acquisitions Department show that the equatorial jungles of northwestern Nikar suggest that the relic of this clay may have survived. Rumors are that the pelt and skull suggest an animal weighing half a ton at least, but the librarians have not confirmed. Several echidnas were brought, but in the face of competition with multituberculates, the only one to survive to modern times is Murray Glossus chimerensis the giant echidna. As they are highly proficient swimmers, being descended from aquatic animals like the platypus, they have maintained a single species status throughout their regularly island-hopping range in the inland sea and either settling on islands to gorge on termites and ants, or seek new territory along the cycling currents of the shallow sea. They aren't part of the famous cast on the prairie, but they are found in Titan gardens, dense jungles, and wetlands. Although most range between 60 and 80 pounds, generally larger in their southern range, a population that has been isolated on a large island west of the known world is rumored to exceed 200 pounds to deter local predators and enjoy exclusive access to the termite and ant nests on the island. Marsupials were harvested in abundance. Most smaller species were unable to outcompete multituberculates and rodents in the Titan Gardens, but the dry, 
temperate highlands south of the mountains provided a bit of a sanctuary. Quals, numbats, and bandicoots are all found in Arvel, most common in the highland steppe habitat. Wombats are present in the highlands too. Diprotodontids had some initial success in Arvel. They held on the longest in the highlands, but the harvest of Europe brought cave lions, homotherium, and cave hyenas to this habitat, which hunted most to extinction. And the competition with ungulates, kangaroos, and the steppe mammoth seems to have finished the job. There are rumors that a species might persist in the deserts to the far west of Arvel, but these are unconfirmed and could easily represent a sloth or large multituberculate. Between carnivorans, theropods, and non-therian predators, most mammal predators went extinct pretty quickly after the harvest. Thylacines and devils, for example, don't seem to have lasted more than a thousand years before disappearing from the fossil record. An exception to this trend is Thylacoleo, the marsupial lion. These bulky predators were originally built to tackle the likes of Diprotodon, and this readily translated to the abundance of sloths. Thumb claws aid in grappling, and the strongest bite of any mammal predator drives their shearing teeth for a rapid kill. For half a million years after harvest, they established a tenuous partition with big cats, with tigers taking the closed forests to the north, Dilophilus, the wetlands of both continents and closed forests of Arvel, Homotherium, the prairies and highland forests, and Thylacoleo, the titan gardens all under the supervision of Megaraptorans and staying off the ground to avoid cockatrices. Unfortunately, the next harvest and an influx of fauna from the eastern continent upset this delicate balance. Leopards coming from Pleistocene Africa further isolated and outcompeted members of this brief but successful dynamic. The Lacoleo is still found in the known world, but as a fraction of their former range. The northern pouch lion is fairly common in the highland forests of the Nikar. The western species is larger and much bulkier, being found in the titan gardens of Arvel. Both species specialize in sloths and other slower armored megafauna. There was a Parcardian species which, although extinct in the wild, appears to have been domesticated by the first children and is still found as pets amongst the maku of the eastern continent. A northern pouch lion is the antagonist of the second short story in my first anthology, wherein I discuss more about their ecology and role in Chimeran folklore. Macropodids not only include the largest marsupials in the known world, they are also among the most successful. There are four species of tree kangaroo in the known world, two in the forests of Arvel, one in the Nikari forests, and one in Picardia. At least one small macropod, usually a wallaby, is found in most habitats of the known world. The common wallaby is found on every continent and many of the islands between. The water wallaby is, pardon the phrase, a highly successful island hopper in the inland sea. All macropods are proficient swimmers, using powerful alternating kicks and flexible tails for propulsion, but this species excels at the task. They are excellent climbers. With flexible diets, diving for seagrass, and processing almost any tough foliage on the islands, it's easy to see how they were so successful in this context. They are found throughout the inland sea and most coastal habitats of the known world. Females can seal their pouches while swimming, but if the joey is too large to seal but not big enough to swim on its own, they will often take up residence on an island during which time males of the group are especially aggressive towards other herbivores that might eat the foliage that the females are relying on for food. Although they aren't fond of ferns and horsetails common in the Titan Gardens, kangaroos are found in the open forest habitats. There is enough grass and deciduous leaves to sustain a moderate population, and they tend to balance with deer, taking on the drier highlands while deer are more common in this niche in lowland forests. They are most abundant in the Housie Prairie, with two species in respectable abundance. The woolly kangaroo is still found in the Arvel of Highlands, being among the most successful herbivores there. Largest of the Chimeran macropods, and indeed the largest marsupial in the known world, is the Age, or demon kangaroo. These short-faced browsers are quite unlike most kangaroos, walking tall rather than hopping, stepping on a single hoofed toe on each foot, 
and using clawed hands to feed on high branches. The Ajay and Arvel can stand 10 feet tall and reach well over 15, giving them a wide range to choose from. They prefer leaves of deciduous trees, but can feed on a wide range of flora. They are highly efficient travelers, and are among the many animals comfortable island hopping throughout the inland sea, meaning that this single species is found in forests throughout the known world. Their name is in reference to the long assumption that they were a type of homunculus, understandable given their divergent features from other kangaroos that in many ways converge with people. The harvest of Australian fauna has left a distinct mark on the known world. Its legacy is found on every continent, large island, and the space between. Cheers to Raoul the Fool for sponsoring this episode. Was so excited to get the request for this one. Ended up needing a ton of new art, but I expect it will come in handy in preparing for future episodes. Thank you so much to my patrons for your continued support. Makes all of this possible. My thanks to all of you for taking the time to watch this, and I hope you've enjoyed. Until next time, cheers folks!